Okay, our final speaker of this week uh, is Izzet Coşkun. He's going to continue with his uh, fourth talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for sticking around. So um, today I want to talk about higher analogs of uh, high analogs of what we've been talking about until now for a higher genus curve. So let me let me just briefly remind you in the first lecture we saw that if you have a general I should say non degenerate here so let me add that a general non degenerate rational curve in projective space right then its normal bundle is uh, is balanced and you had to be a little bit careful about the characteristic here so maybe this is true over the complex numbers we saw that in p3 for instance in characteristic 2 then even the degree curves, the, their normal bundles weren't balanced, right? Um, but at least over the complex numbers, we saw that, um, you know, if you have a general rational curve, then the normal bundle is as balanced as possible. You know, we also computed what they were if they were not, if they were degenerate, right? And we also saw that an argument due to Sakiro that said that all possible splitting types, you know, given the degree and the possibilities of the geometry, all the possible splitting types, the rank and the degree, and the fact that, you know, the individual sum has had to be at least d plus two if the curve was non-degenerate, then um, we saw that all such possible splitting types are occur. Um, furthermore, I mean, we talked about like in what co-dimension the different splittings occur, and then we saw that there not everything was quite as expected. But anyway, so the question that I want to ask today is how about higher genus curves? So the first question you face when you ask this question about higher genus curves is that what do we even mean? What should be the analog of balanced normal bundle? In the case of P1, this was clear because every vector bundle was some of line bundles. So we could talk about the various degrees. So you see the analog of balanced and higher genus, I would argue is the right analog is stability. So, you know, the, the right notion of stability. And yeah, that's the notion that goes back to Mumford. So let me tell you what it is. Suppose that you have a vector bundle over a curve. So this is a curve, okay? Then we can define the slope of this vector bundle, and it's defined as the degree of the vector bundle divided by the rank. Okay. And then the definition is like this: we call the vector bundle semi-stable if, for all subbundles of some smaller rank, you have that uh, maybe I should say non-zero, or for all proper ones, yeah. That then what you have is that the slope of the subbundle is less than or equal to the slope of E, and it's semi stable if equality can hold. If it's always strict in equality, then you call the bundle stable. So, this notion is central to the theory of moduli. So, for instance, there is a compact moduli space of parameterizing semi stable vector bundles of a given rank and degree on a on the fixed curve, um, you know, you have to be a little bit careful when you're talking about semi-stable bundles instead of stable bundles. And it's not quite parameterizing isomorphism classes, but something called S equivalence classes. But we don't need to know any of these kinds of things. Okay. So so you see, the point is like this. So so now, now the question that we can ask is is the normal bundle of the general curve stable? Okay. So if I give you a family of curves, you know, in projective space or in some variety, you can always ask the question, is the normal bundle of general curve stable? Okay, so now let's just, um, so, so first maybe let me make a remark. So what does semi-stability mean for, um, for P1? So if you had a vector bundle on P1, right? Right? Then the slope of this thing, the degree is the sum of the AIs and the rank say is R. So if all these AIs are not equal, right? If there's a maximal AI, then that number is bigger than the average, right? If there's a bigger, like, so the only way you can have a semi-stable bundle on P1 
P1 and the rank is bigger than one is if all the numbers are equal. And in that case, you have a semi stable, strictly semi stable bundle. So, in particular, you know, semi stable bundles on P1 are the perfectly balanced ones. So, you know, this is a reasonable um, generalization of the notion of balance, I think. So, let, let's just see what happens. Okay, so the first thing is that if you let's take let's suppose that we have a complete intersection curve of some degrees d1 up to dn minus one in projective space right then we know what the normal bundle of this curve is it's the, again a sum of these line bundles. So in particular, this thing is again not semi stable unless all the degrees are equal and in particular, most of the time, if you have like you know you choose some some integers and you know you didn't choose them all equally so then that means that the normal bundle of any of these complete intersection curves are not going to be semi-stable you know <clears throat> you know typically if you choose yourself uh, random numbers you're not going to make them equal so that's you know <clears throat> what you see is that complete intersection curves are not going to typically have state, they will never have stable normal bundles and they will even most of the time not have semi stable normal bundles. But you see, the problem is that the complete intersection curves are very special. Okay, so somehow if we want the answer to this question to be yes, we need to really, we need to really talk about the general curve. Right, but you see the problem is that in the case of rational curves right we said that basically rational curves are parameterized by an open set in the vector space or something like this, so you know we could talk about the general member. So now we we face the question about what do we mean by a general curve okay. Right, so, so the difficulty here is that if you look at the space of smooth curves at degree d and genus g and projective space. That typically is not an irreducible space. There are many components of that space, right? There can be many different types of, um, you know, smooth curves of degree d and genus g. So it's not very clear what you mean by a general curve. So let's first, you know, this question was a very vague question: Is the normal bundle of the general curve stable, right? So now I need to sort of make the terms. Uh, a little bit more precise. I've explained what it means to be stable. Now I need to explain to you what the general curve means. Okay. So the answer to this question comes from Brill Noether theory. So, <clears throat> you know, I didn't talk much about the classical theory of curves in these lectures. So, you know, it's sort of this was lectures on topics on curves, but, you know, we didn't talk about any of the classical theory. So maybe let me briefly summarize like the classical theory. So now what does Brill Noether theory ask? So suppose you give yourself a curve of genus G. Okay. So the one thing that we should know is that there is a moduli space MG, which parameterizes smooth curves of genus G. This is, let me assume that G is at least two to not run into trouble. So smooth curves of genus G up to isomorphism, right? This turns out to be a quasi-projective variety of dimension 3G minus three, right? So we are going to secretly refer to this, even though we don't need to know much about the geometry of this thing. The only thing that we need to know is that it's irreducible, okay? So, okay, so say that we have a curve of genus G, so an abstract curve of genus G. The question that you can ask is, when can you map this curve by a degree D map to project the space? And, you know, we should, to be precise, we should, we should specify that the curve should be, that the map should be non-degenerate because, you know, if you can put the curve in P2 already, then you can put it in all PR, but that's not that interesting. So we really want it to be non-degenerate, okay? So there is an expectation in this case. Suppose that you have a line bundle of degree D, right? Then you can take all the sections of this line bundle. So if I want to get a map, so you know, if you give a map from C to PR, right? Then you see there is an O of one here. And if the degree is D and you pull it back, right? So I get a line bundle of degree D on the C. And if I want this map to be non-degenerate, then this line bundle had better have at least R plus one sections. 
and then I guess you also want it to be base point free, but you know if it had base points, then you can subtract them and make the degree become smaller. So, so, so basically the question that we are asking is when can you find a line bundle of degree D on the curve with at least R plus one sections, okay? And this one you can view as a degeneracy locus of a map of vector bundles on the Picard, Picard variety of the curve, so pick D of C, which is a torus of genus G, I mean, the, the torus of dimension G. So this is an abelian variety of dimension G. And you can make the computation. You can see that the expected co-dimension in which this happens is the age naught times the age one of this line bundle. So age naught should be at least R plus one. And then, you know, the age one then turns out to be G minus D plus R, right? So that what you see is that the expected co-dimension is this. And so that you get that, you get this famous brill noether number, rho GRD, which is G minus R plus one times G minus D plus R, okay? And of course, you know, there is a usual expectation. I mean, you know, <laughs> the first thing that you can say is that if this number is non-negative, then you expect there to be such line bundles with at least R plus one sections so that you can map your curve um, to PR by, as, by a map of degree D, yeah? And furthermore, what you expect is that if this number is negative, then there shouldn't be any such maps, right? That the co-dimension of having such a thing is too large compared to G, so you don't there expect to see any. And the classical brill noether theorem says that basically that expectation is true. So this was, I believe, stated in the 19th century by Brill and Noether. The first so the existence proof, like the fact that if this number is non-negative, uh, then there exists, then every curve admits such a map was proved, you know, following ideas of Mumford by Laxoff and Kleinman and Kemp independently, yeah? And the first one, the first non-existence part of the theorem was proved by Griffiths and Harris, and then many other proofs were given by Eisenbach, Harris, Giesecker, Lazarsfeld, you know, Basically, in the 1970s and 80s, this problem like received a lot of attention, and almost all the major mathematicians, algebraic geometers, uh, contributed something to the problem. But so here is what uh, the theorem says at the end. So a general curve of genus G has a GRD. So a G so GRD is a linear system like this. If we have a line bundle of degree D and R plus one sections, we'll call that the GRD for short, rather than saying all that those words over and over again. So a general curve of genus G has a GRD if and only if this Brill, Brill Noether number is greater than or equal to zero. And now what does general here mean? That now has a meaning because we said that this moduli space is an irreducible variety. So outside the proper algebraic set in this irreducible variety, then if you pick a general enough curve in there, then what this is saying is that it will have a GRD precisely when this real northern number is non-negative. Furthermore, I mean, you know, um, a lot more is known. You can ask what's the dimension of the locus of GRDs in the Picard uh, Picard variety, and this dimension is given by the brill noether number. And furthermore, this is irreducible and smooth away from the locus of GR plus one, these, at least if the rho is positive. Of course, if rho is zero, then there are finitely many, so it can't be irreducible. But in any case, there is always a unique component of the universal space of GRDs dominating MG. And that happens if and only if this brill noether number is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so that's the brill noether package. And, you know, there are some other aspects of the theorem that I'm not <clears throat> saying. And as I said, this was developed in the early to mid 80s by a lot of people. So, um, but what's the upshot for us? So, so what, what's the upshot of the classical story? So, if this brill noether number is positive, and this the PR, the R is greater than or equal to three, then there is a unique component of the Hilbert scheme whose general member is a smooth non-degenerate curve of degree D and genus G in PR and which also dominates MG bar, okay? 
So then we can make like um, general curve really precise in the sense that we mean that it's uh, a member, a general curve in this component. So let me caution you, there may be other components. Even when this row is positive, there may be other components parameterizing smooth curves of that genus and degree, but they don't dominate the moduli space. In other words, those curves are very special in moduli. Um, but, um, you know, the key point here is that, you know, as long as the spill northern number is positive and you're talking P3 and larger, right, then uh, there is a unique component of the Hilbert scheme parameterizing smooth non degenerate curves of degree D and genus G. So that's what we are going to talk about. That's the component that we are going to talk about. And a curve in this component, we will just call a Brill Noether curve. And when R equals three, which is, will be the subject of this talk, we'll call it the Brill Noether space curve. Now you see it now makes sense to talk about the general Brill Noether curve. Okay, so let me sort of go back and fix my question now. Is the normal bundle of the general Brill Noether curve stable? Okay, now, now this makes uh, this makes some sense, yeah? <clears throat> okay. All right, so now let, let, let's see some examples, okay? Let, let's look at an elliptic cortex. So now what's an elliptic cortex? An elliptic cortex is we are in P3, we have a genus one curve and it has degree four, okay? It turns out that such a curve is a complete intersection of two quadric hypersurfaces because, you know, you can look at the ideal of the curve in degree two. It maps, of course, to OP3 in degree two and OC of two, right? Now, the point here is we know by riemann roth that this has eight sections and we know that this has 10 sections, right? If you look at quadratic polynomials and four variables, there are 10 dimensional space of them. So that you see that there are two quadrics that vanish on the curve. And then, you know, from there it follows that this curve has to be the intersection of these two quadrics. And now you see as a result, you see that the normal bundle of this elliptic curve is OC of two plus OC of two, right? In particular, this is semi-stable, but not stable, okay? Then there's a general theorem here due to Ein and Lazarsfeld that says that if you look at the normal bundle of an elliptic normal curve in PN, it's always semi-stable. The general one is always semi-stable. Okay. Um, so in this case, you know, in the case of elliptic cortex, you see that the bundle is not stable, but the semi-stable. Okay. Let's look at the next example. Now let me look at degree equals five and genus equals two. Okay. If you look at degree equals five and genus equals two, then such a curve is also contained always in a quadric. Let's check. I have the ideal degree two equations vanishing on the curve sit on degree two equations in P3. As we said, that's 10 dimensional. Now, if you look at OC of two by riemann roth you know, age not of that is equal to the degree, which is 10 minus the genus plus one. So you see that's equal to nine. In other words, the, the map on global sections, you know, has to have a kernel. This is a 10 dimensional, this has a 10 dimensional space of global sections. There's a map to a nine dimensional space and there has to be a kernel. So that means that every curve lies on the quadric. In fact, if you look at the quadric, like this is a curve of type two, three on this, typically it's this curve of type two, three on a smooth quadric. So let's look at what happens to the normal bundle. So you see, I have the normal bundle of the curve in the quadric. It sits in the normal bundle of the curve in P3 and the co-kernel is OC of two. We just said that this has degree 10. So its slope is 10. Ah, we should, okay. And then let's look at what happens. What's the normal bundle of the curve in the quadric? So that's the two, three curve. So the normal bundle is given by the self intersection, right? So that has two times three plus two times three degree 12. So there you see this has a degree 12 sub bundle mapping with quotient to degree 10. So this has degree 22, right? So its slope is 11, whereas there's a line bundle of slope 12. So do you see this is not even semi-stable, right? So the normal bundle 
of the curve in P3 is not semi-stable when the degree is five and genus is two. All right, so in this case, the answer is no. Let's do one more example. Let's look at the canonical curve of genus four. So this is the canonical curve of genus four. Okay. And then, so this has degree six and genus four. So let's see what happens. We can play the same game. And the idea is that this is also contained in the quadric. So you have the curves, quadrics vanishing on the curve mapping to this, then we need to compute OC of two. So the degree of, by riemann roch the degree is 12 minus the genus is four plus one. This is also nine, right? So the global sections mapping to the global sections here must have a kernel, right? This is a 10 dimensional vector space of global sections. This has a nine dimensional vector space of global sections. So if you have a map like that, there has to be a kernel. So there has to be a quadric. And typically such a curve is a curve of type three, three on the quadric. So again, we have the normal bundle sequence that goes the normal bundles of the curve in the quadric maps to the normal bundle of the curve in P3 and the co-kernel is OC of two. This we just said has degree 12, right? And this has degree 18. So 33.33 three, three 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 is nine plus nine is 18. So you see that here is a normal bundle with slope 15 and it has a line sub bundle of degree 18. So it's being destabilized, so it's not stable. All right, so this is not so promising, you know, if you want to say that these things are always stable. So far, I'm only giving you examples that are not stable. Okay, so let, let's do an example where it does stable, and this is due to Balikonelia. So now I'm going to look at a non hyperelliptic, non trigonal space curve of degree seven and genus five. Okay. Let, let's compute the, I, I should have computed this in general. I think I computed later, but I should have done it earlier. So, so let's compute the degree of the normal bundle. So you see, say that you have a curve. So we have curve C and P3. So we have the tangent bundle of the curve maps to the tangent bundle of P3 restricted to the curve goes to the normal bundle. Okay. So the degree of the tangent bundle of a curve is two minus two G, yeah. So the degree of the tangent bundle of P3 is four, four times the hyperplane class. If you restrict the determinants four times the hyperplane class, if you restrict that to the curve, then you get here 4D. So then you conclude that the degree of the normal bundle is 4D plus 2G minus two. Since its rank is two, then the slope of the normal bundle is 2d plus g minus one. So you see, the goal is always to say that you don't have a line bundle of, of this degree or line sub bundle of this degree or smaller, if you want to show that it's stable. So now let's say that the normal bundle of the curve in P3 is stable. You see, you can do like trickery. Like if a bundle is stable, then it's dual is stable, okay? And if you twist it by something, it's still stable, right? Like, because yeah, yeah, you, if you twist it by a line bundle, it's still stable. Because, you know, if you have a subsheaf, right, of this that was destabilizing, then I twist back by minus three, it will still be destabilized, okay? So instead, let me look at this bundle and prove that this is stable. It's equivalent to the stability of the original bundle, okay? So I'm looking at the normal bundle twist dual of the normal bundle twisted by three. So let's see what the degrees are. So first we said, so the degree was seven, the genus was five. So let's see what the degree is of the normal bundle. I computed it here again, the claim is 36. Let's double check to make sure that we didn't mess up. So if I have 28 plus 10 minus two, it looks like it's 36. So the degree of the normal bundle is 36. So that means that the dual has negative the degree. So the dual of the normal bundle has degree minus 36. And now if I twist it by three, then each time I twist it, I'm twisting it up by 14. So if I twist it by three, I'm twisting up by 42 so that the degree of this is six, okay? 
So the, the so now we are trying to show that this degree six rank two bundle is stable. Okay. Now how can it be destabilized? So you know if, if it's going to be destabilized, it means that there has to be a line bundle of degree three or more. Let's suppose there is such a thing. Suppose that I do have a line bundle L of degree three or more and say that it's destabilizing like this. So in particular, the degree of this M is less than or equal to three, right? And now remember what we assumed about the curve was that it was not hyperelliptic and it was not trigonal. So that means that a line bundle of degree three on this curve can have at most one section, okay? All right, so what we know is that this has at most one section. Okay, so now let's see what happens, okay? All right, let me look at the curve. So, you, so the first claim is that this curve, such a curve, remember our curves are degree seven and genus five, right? <clears throat> such a curve ha can lie, has to lie in at least three cubic. The reason is if you, again, look at the ideal in degree three, mapping to polynomials of degree three and P3 and OC of three, Riemann Rho tells you that this has dimension 17 because let's do the Riemann Rho, the degree was seven. So this is 21 minus the genus plus one, that's equal to 17. There are 20 cubic, 20 dimensional space of cubic polynomials in P3, right? Things like X cube, Y cube, Z cube, W cube, or whatever. So you can, you can count that, right? So that means that this curve lies on at least the three dimensional family of cubics. So C lies on a greater than or equal to three dimensional family of cubics. All right, so now let's write the normal bundle sequence. So I have the square of the ideal mapping to the ideal in degree three, and then I have the normal bundle twisted by three. Now you see, you can't have a cubic that's double on a, on a degree seven curve. You know, a cubic can be double along a line and that, that's the, the most it can be, or it could be reducible, I guess, but you know, the, the, the curve is irreducible. So these cubics are irreducible. So the, the only double locus of irreducible cubic can be aligned. So it certainly can't be degree seven, okay? So there are no cubics double along the curve. So the, the, that one is zero, right? So then you see, I have the space of cubics containing the curve maps to the dual of the normal bundle twisted by three. And this is three dimensional, right? The, this has three dimensional space of sections and the kernel is zero. So then it means that the image of the, the cubics and the ideal in the global sections of the dual of the normal bundle twisted by three has dimension at least three, okay? Well, let's go back our, to the, our destabilizing sequence. So I have the things that come from H not of L and I have the things that go to H not of M, right? And I have the H not, the global sections of this thing. Well, let me look at the dimension of H not of L intersect the image. Well, plus the dimension of H not of M has to be greater than or equal to three, right? Because this is dimensions at most three. On the other hand, we know that this is at most one, right? Because this curve is not trigonal or hyperelliptic. This is at most one. So it says that, you see, the dimension of H not of L mapping to this image of the cubics is at least two, yeah? In other words, what that means is that if I can find, so here is your curve, right? You can find three cubics that contain this, you can find at least two independent cubics that contain this curve. And like, you know, the normal bundles lie in the same line sub bundle <clears throat> or like, do, 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 like they sat lie in the same, so, so you can find two cubics, two independent cubics containing the curve, right? And um, these things, lie in, in the image of the same line sub bundle in the dual of the normal bundle. In other words, what that means is that these two cubics have to be tangent everywhere along the curve, right? That's what it means. <laughs> okay, but now you see that's nonsense because if you are two cubics and project in P3, right? By Bezu, their intersection has degree naught. 
but now we are saying that these two are like you know they are tangent everywhere along around along this curve of degree seven and that cannot happen right and that would the, the intersection number would be at least 14 so you see that that cannot happen and the cubics remember have to be irreducible so so you see that this is not possible so that hence by bezu you see that there can't be such an l and we conclude that this normal bundle has to be stable okay so you see that you know this is very special to this thing and it's a fairly I mean, it's not that bad, but you know, it's a somewhat involved argument, and especially to the degree seven and genus five, you can't make this art. like it really is heavily dependent on the numerics here. Okay. But yeah, this is of course some evidence, and that so far I've given you mostly evidence that the bundles were not stable. So, but then here's an evidence that they are stable. So where is the right answer? So here is the theorem, and this. I mean, everything I'm going to say from now on is joint work with Eric Larson and Isabel Vogt. Uh, so let me make it clear that this is joint with Eric Larson and Isabel Vogt. And the theorem is like this. Suppose that I have a general Brill-Noether space curve of degree D and genus G over an algebraically closed field K of you know, arbitrary characteristics. So we have, we have a general brill noether curve of degree D and genus G. Then the statement is that the normal bundle of this curve is stable. Again, it's general, right? Is stable if and only if the genus is at least two and the degree and genus are not five, two, and six, four. In other words, these examples that I showed you, the two examples that I showed you here, the degrees, degree five genus two and degree six and genus four are the only counter examples to the statement. To the statement that the normal bundle is always stable. We saw those two examples, it wasn't true. So, but except in those cases, if you're looking at curves of genus at least two, then the normal bundle is stable. Two, the normal bundle is strictly semi-stable if and only if the genus is less than two, and one of the following things happens. Either the genus is one, right? The reason for that is that, you know, you see that in that case, we know the complete classification of stable bundles on an elliptic curve, right? So, so there are no even rank and even degree, you know, uh, stable bundles, but they're semi-stable bundles. So in that case, the bundle is strictly semi-stable or, you see, so, so, so now what's left, of course, is genus one or genus zero. So what we are saying is that in the case of genus one, um, you know, it's always strictly semi-stable. And in the case of genus zero, sort of what we know is that, you know, the normal bundle is going to be balanced except in characteristic two, right? And the degree is even. So what it's saying is that, you know, if the characteristic is not two, then your even in genus zero, you're balanced, so you're strictly semi-stable. Or if the degree is odd, then the, then the normal bundle is balanced, so it's strictly semi-stable. And when is it unstable? It's unstable when the degree and the genus are given by 5, 2, and 6, 4, as we saw, or the characteristic is to the genus is zero and the degree is even. So this is a complete characterization of when the stability of um, general brill noether curves in space over any characteristics so that's the theorem okay and of course the main the main interest of course in this case is this this one right that that these bundles in higher genus are always stable all right any questions about the statement before i go on okay if not, so let me tell you a little bit about the history of this. I mean, we did talk a little bit about the history when we were talking about the um, um, balanced bundles and so on and so forth. So as I said, normal bundles of rational course have been extensively studied. So, you know, Sakiero, Ran, Gioni, Eisenbad, Van de Van, we talked about uh, these results in the first lecture, so I'm not going to repeat it. So normal bundles of genus one curves have also been studied. And you know, I mentioned the theorem of Ein Lazarsfeld. So by Ellen's good luck, so here show it's Ein Lazarsfeld where they proved sort of the semi-stability. 
In higher genus, the results are more sporadic. So I already told you the argument of Balico and Elia for degrees seven in genus five. Elia proved the case of degree six in genus three. Sakira had done degree six in genus two. Newstead did the degree nine in genus nine case. I mean, I'm not sure whether there were other isolated cases that I'm not aware of, but th these are the ones that at least I know. Um, I should, uh, I think that almost always these papers are over the complex numbers and most of the time the arguments would also work in characteristic P, but you need to pay some attention. Um, and then, uh, you know, Ellingsrud and Hershowitz announced the stability in an asymptotic range of degrees in genera. Um, as far as I know, they never wrote down the proof or I, we couldn't find it in the literature, but you know, they, they had an asymptotic statement that if the degree and the genus are sufficiently large, then these things become stable. It's not entirely clear to me whether they are talking about real Noether curves. I think the way they do it is that they say maybe that there exists a curve of this degree and genus with stable normal bundle. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. It, it's a little bit hard to tell because they never wrote the proof. So, so I'm not sure exactly what, or at least I haven't seen it in the literature. So I, I'm not entirely certain um, you know, of all the details of their theorems. Okay. So that that's the that's sort of a history here, and so 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 so, and then you see you can have many conjectures here, right? I mean, um, the first sort of basic conjecture that you can say so this was only the case r equals three, but you know it should be a general phenomenon that the normal bundle of a general real Noether curve of genus at least two in PR should be stable except for finitely many triples d g and r and you know if you sit down and think a little bit you can also figure out what the list of d g and r have to be but i'm not going to say it here so um because then it becomes a little bit easier to sort of disprove it so, so we'll be a little bit uh, careful and not list them but you know you, you you can easily make what the list should be um and you know there are related conjectures here um you know there's a related conjecture of a proto farkas and ortega which says that the normal bundle of a general canonical curve of genus at least seven is stable um this is known, I believe, in genus seven and genus eight, where I believe a student of Farkas, whose name is currently escaping me, has uh, written a paper about this. Um, okay. Um, and then, you, you know, you can make many conjectures of this type. I mean, you know, like, um, there is no reason to stop here, right? I mean, I mean there are various things, various additional things that you can say. Like, for instance, as the degree, if you fix the genus, fix the genus, you see, as the degree goes to infinity, right? Um, and it's fixed the genus in the PR, right? As the degree goes to infinity, then there, like the number of ways you can embed the curve grows rapidly right so that you can ask whether all possible nor all possible normal bound like you know whether all stable bundles occur as the normal bound or the general stable bundle occurs i mean so let's let, let me write this thing a little bit better so it's, it's intelligible so so fix fix g and pr so, you know as d tends to infinity, right? Or if d is large, let's say if d is sufficiently large, right? You can ask the question, does the general stable bundle occur as the normal bundle? So this would be sort of the analog of the Sakero result, which said that all possible splitting types on P1 occur uh, as normal bundles of rational curves, right? So you could ask, um, I mean, does the general stable bundle, of course, of the correct degree and rank, right? Occur as the normal bundle. You could say, does every, you know, you could replace general by every, maybe, I don't know. 
I, I don't know the answers to these questions and I believe they're widely open. And then, you know, there's no reason why you should stop with curves. I mean, you could take higher dimensional varieties as well. Like for instance, an interesting question would be P2, right? Suppose that you take a general map from P2 to Pn, right? Non-degenerate, non-degenerate in degree D and general, right? You can ask whether the normal bundle is stable. But, you know, you can also choose to replace P2 by, you know, your favorite variety and ask, like, you know, various questions, like, you know, under suitable assumptions, whether you can show that the normal bundle is stable. Um, this we know when it's the Veronese embedding. We know that the answer is yes, but if it's not, then I don't think we know the answer to this question. So, I mean, except in some special cases, like, you know, if you're putting it in P4 or something like this, then you can do it. But, um, <clears throat> but I believe in general, this is open. I'm not aware of a, an answer to this. But, you know, you can ask all sorts of other kinds of questions too, whether like, what are the possible normal bundles? How much of the moduli space can you realize this way? And so on and so forth. As far as I know, these questions are, fairly interesting and generally open. So, but, um, so you should be aware of the existence of these questions if you're looking for problems to think about. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do in the rest of this lecture is give a sketch of the proof of this theorem. You know, it's not an easy theorem to prove. It takes, it has quite a number of cases that you need to analyze. So I'm not going to attempt to give a proof but I'll just choose one or two ideas and explain those, okay? So again, the theorem here is that, you know, the main part of the theorem is that if you have a general brill noether curve of genus at least two, and you are not these two special cases, then the normal bundle is stable. Okay, so now how do you do it? So, so again, like just concretely, what is it that we want? You see, if you, we did this calculation already. So we have the normal bundle, right? The normal bundle has the slope, it's rank two and this degree, right? So what we want to show is that there any line sub bundle of the normal bundle has degree less than or equal to 2D plus 2D, 2D plus G minus two. Okay, so the idea is like this. We, re we specialize to a reducible curve. So you take your curve and you break it maybe into two pieces, maybe in more pieces, right? So now what we want to do is that we want to analyze the stability of the normal bundle of the reducible curve. Stability of the normal bundle of the reducible curve. So now how do we do it? So here is the situation you see. First of all, we need to understand what it means to have a stable bundle on a reducible curve. So suppose that C is a nodal curve, then you can consider the normalization, right? So now here I drew the simple picture. Say that you have two components meeting transversely at P. If you look at the normalization, you pull apart these two components and there's a point P1 and a point P2 mapping to this point P. Suppose that you have a vector bundle on E, then you can pull it back. So by this normalization map, and then you see, suppose that you have a sub bundle of this normalization. Now you see, if you have just the sub bundle of the normalization, right? There is no reason why the sub bundle should be a pullback of the sub bundle of E. Like in particular, these two sub bundles don't have to match over P1 and P2, right? But sort of, I want to generalize sort of the idea of slope. So to take care of this, so that this will vary well in families, okay? And it will be easier to deal with. So let's do it. So we'll call something the adjusted slope, where you take the slope of F, say that you have a sub bundle of this pullback of E, right? But you see, now what happens here is that, you know, there is an identification of the fiber of E over P1 and P2, right? And then say that F is here and F is there, right? 
under this identification on one part, like, you know, this is over C1, this is over C2. So this is the fiber over P1, this is the fiber over P2. I can identify the E's. So then I can talk about how much the fibers of F intersect. Okay. So then what you do is you adjust your slopes such that you, you subtract for every singular point, you subtract the co-dimension of the intersection in the fiber. And it doesn't matter like uh, which of the, which of the, whether this is the co-dimension of F and P1 or F and P2, right? Because they, they will be the same, right? So what it is is that, you know, you've identified these things. So you view them in the same vector space. So there is here is the F, maybe they intersect just there, right? So you call that the co-dimension of the, the co-dimension. You, so you subtract for the co-dimension of that and divide by the rank of F. So this is what I'll define, I'll call the adjust the slope, right? Um, so then you see, then, then with this adjust the slope, then I can talk about semi-stability of bundles on the nodal curve. And what it will be is that I'll call this thing semi-stable if the adjust the slope of every sub-bundle is less than or equal to the, the adjust the slope of E, right? Um, so the point of this definition is that it is designed so that it behaves well in families. So, you know, you can check relatively easily that if you have a family of nodal connected curves over a DVR and E is a vector bundle on the family, if the central fiber is semi-stable, then the general fiber is also semi-stable. Okay, so that, that's the role of the, so then you see the goal the goal here is going to be that, you know, I'll try to do induction on the degree and the genus, and I need to just work with the reducible ones and just check some base cases. Okay. All right. So the idea is this, we are going to take our curve of genus G and degree D for which we somehow know that the normal bundle is stable. Yeah. And what we are going to do is we are going to look at you know, we are going to add a secant line to it. Ah, a one secant line is what I should say. Like a line that meets the curve quasi transversely, right? So what that does is that it keeps the genus the same. It increases the degree by one. The other thing we'll do is we'll add a secant line meeting quasi transversely, the curve quasi transversely at two points. So that will increase the degree by one and the genus by one. And the other thing that we are going to do is we are going to add a, a two secant conic, a, sorry, a four secant conic. A four secant conic. So what that does is that it increases the degree by two and the genus by three, okay? Of course, the first thing that you need to check, right? is that when you do this thing, if you started with a Brill-Noder curve, you still get a Brill-Noder curve. I mean, there's something to check, right? Because it could be that, you know, you made a random curve and this doesn't lie in the correct components of the Hilbert scheme, right? So you do need to check that these things are Brill-Noder curves. In this particular instance, that's not that hard to check, but anyway, but, but you know, you do need to do this and it is true that these are still Brill-Noder curves. Okay, if I started with a C being a brill noder curve, right? And then if I do this operation, then I end up with a brill noder curve, okay? So the first like simple observation is like this. So suppose that we took our family of curves, like of genus D plus one G, D plus one G plus one, or D plus two G plus D or something, right? And we bro broke it into two pieces. So this is a nodal curve and say that E is a vector bundle on this whole curve, such as the normal bundle, right? That's at the end of the day, this is the one that we care about, right? So now you see, if both of these restrictions are semi-stable, right? If the restriction of E to C1 and the restriction of C2 is semi-stable, and then you get that E is semi-stable. Furthermore, if only one of them is stable, then you get that E is stable, okay? And then using this degeneration argument that we said, then you can conclude that for the general member of the family, these bundles that you got are stable, right? And here the point is like this, right? 
<clears throat> I need to sort of uh, keep track. So say that I have this bundle, I have the sub bundle, yeah? Now you see the adjusted slope of this F is less than or equal to, you know, the slope of F restricted to X plus the slope of F restricted to Y, right? Because I'm subtracting some sort of whether they match or not, right? And by assumption, then you're saying that because this thing, um, you know, because these restrictions are semi-stable, right? I get that this has to be less than or equal to this. This has to be less than or equal to this. And, you know, if one of them is stable, then you would get strict inequality, right? It would be strict if one of them is strict, right? Which is the slope of you. So, so you know, that, that's what we are saying, basically. So, so you see, you make proving stability, like, you know, you make it a little bit easier, actually. Okay. So now what's the idea here? The idea is this. So suppose that I look at the general Brillnoder curve in the good, uh, you know, in the good component and let me break it to a fork secant quantity. Now you see, so this C is a Brillnoder curve and this is R is my four secant conic. It's meeting the curve quasi transversely at these four points, okay? So now the basic observation is that we talked about the normal bundles of rational curves, right? So, or more generally, the normal bundle of nodal curves, right? If I have a nodal curve, so you see, if you have a nodal curve, right? Then you have the union curve, then you can talk about the normal bundle of this curve restricted to each of the components. Now, if you take the normal bundle of that curve and restrict it to that component, as we said, that's the normal bound. You, it's the normal bundle of the C1, but you allow a pole in at P, like say that you have a node P. So you allow node poles at P in the direction of the tangent spaces of C2, right? That's what we discussed before. And now if you think about what this means, so if you look at the normal bundle of um, normal bundle of the conic, right, it starts out being OP102 plus OP104. So the normal bundle of R itself is OP102 plus OP104, right? And what we are going to do is we are going to bump this up precisely four times, yeah? And then the question is, what is it that you get? What is it that you get is that you get a perfectly balanced normal bundle, except when C has degree three and genus zero or degree four and genus one. And what makes this theorem a little bit annoying to prove is that, of course, there are always these exceptions, right? I mean, you know, there are these two cases when the normal bundle is not stable, right? So when you're trying to prove this thing and you're doing the induction, you have to be extra careful that you don't end up in those cases. But of course, that kind of argument is really not suitable for explaining on the board, and it's even less suitable on for explaining on Zoom. So I'm not going to bother about these things. But you do need to worry about that, right? I mean, it's important. I mean, you know, when you write the paper, you have to worry about it. When you talk about it, then you say that you can just do it. But of course, that, that's where the headaches are, right? Um, but so the point in particular is that you see this is really great news, right? Because I have the situation that, um, you know, the normal bundle of the union of the curve restricted to this rational curve, right? To this conic is already semi-stable. If I knew that the normal bundle restricted to C is stable by induction, then by this observation, then I proved it for, you know, I proved it from dg to whatever, d plus two, g plus three. You know, you get some sort of some sort of thing. But you need to be again careful because the normal bundle restricted to the C, the normal bundle of the union restricted this curve C is not the normal bundle of the curve C, but it's the modification at these four points towards the tangent direction of the con. You know, if it were just the normal bundle of the curve C, then I would be done already. I wouldn't have to do anything, but it's not. So you need to prove, it's not just enough to prove the stability of the normal bundle of C, which supposedly we know by induction, but of this modification, okay? So, but then here is the first reduction. So, so the first reduction is that if the theorem is true up to genus eight, then it's true, okay? 
Now, how do you get around this thing? So what you do is you pull two conics, yeah? You, you pull two conics, two general conics like this. And then what you do is you crash them together. When you crash them together, right? These modifications become twists. And then, you know, if you have a normal bundle and you're, if you have a stable bundle and you twist it, then we know that that's stable. <clears throat> the modifications don't have to be stable, but, you know, again, by the statement that we said is that, you know, if the general member, like, you know, now, now you see we have a, a family of bundles. Now I don't need to worry about the rational curves anymore, right? So now this is only a, curve, a thing on this curve D, I guess is what I call. We know that it's normal bundle is stable and we have these eight modifications. Now you see, I can make a family and crash these things together. If I can exhibit you one such member, which is stable, then the general member is stable. And the one that we can do is you can crash these curves together and to make this thing a twist, which we then know by induction because the normal bundle of D is stable and this twist is stable, then it follows that the general such thing is stable, okay? So what this is saying is that, you know, um, if you have a brill noether curve of degree D minus four and genus G minus six with normal, with stable normal bundle, then you can conclude it for D and G, okay? Anyway, so if you think about what that means is that that just means that you don't only need to worry about up to genus eight. The rest just follow from doing this. Okay, so that's the first reduction. Now what's the second reduction? The second reduction that you want to do is you want to say that if I can prove it for D and G, then it's actually okay for D plus one and G. So that I only need to worry about the lowest degree curve. And in fact, that's the second reduction. So what it says is that if the theorem is true for the following cases, then it is true in general. And for this to work, then you cannot have that the characteristic be true. This is actually false in characteristic two. In characteristic two, you also need to consider these, okay? Um, because after all, I mean, you know, the same statement is not true in characteristic two. So you better not prove, you know, rational curves of even degree have unbalanced uh, normal bundles. So you'd better not prove too much, yeah? <laughs> and this is really where the, char like the characteristic two, like you really see in this calculation, uh, which I'm not going to do for you. So you won't see it much, but uh, anyway, but uh, it really shows up in this calculation, okay? Um, you know, you compute some, uh, you, you know, you compute the determinant of a matrix, then you need to know that that's non-zero, and then there's a coefficient of two, you know, it's the, the most beautiful way characteristic two <laughs> always appears, so. Um, okay, so, but the second reduction is that, you know, you want to reduce to the case of the minimal degree. Now, how do you do this? So the idea is like this. So what you want to do, is that suppose, so now what I want to do is I want to break the curve to a curve where I know that the normal bundle is stable, union align. So remember that doesn't change the genus and it ups the degree by one. So now you see the one slight complication is that if I take the normal bundle of the union, which is my C, sorry, I keep going between C and D for one of the components. So that wasn't good planning. So here C is the total curve, which is D union the line, right? So now if you restrict this normal bundle to the line, right, the normal bundle of the line is O of one plus O of one. But you know, we need to allow a pole in the direction of the tangent space. So now once you do that, you get O of one plus O of two. So you see, this is still balanced, but it's no longer semi-stable. So you see, the kind of thing that now you need to worry about is that there can be a you know, large degree line subbundle of D somehow whose fiber over the node, whose fiber over the node matches with the O of two, right? And that would not be good for stability. So you need to worry about that, okay? But anyway, because this is very close to being semi-stable, right? That's balanced. You know, the difficulty is not so much, right? Because, you know, the, the like, <clears throat> Yeah, it's still okay as long as this is stable. 
and the degree of the normal bundle is st strictly less than the slope, then, then you know, this gain of sort of one half doesn't upset the integer, right? So this is the point that, you know, line bundles have only, you know, integral um, slope, but, you know, sort of a half cannot play a role. So you, you win from there, okay? So, so the point is that luckily the normal one is almost balanced. And if the normal bundle is semi-stable, then the normal bundle of the union is semi-stable if the characteristic is not true. If the characteristic is true, this argument fails, right? And as it has to, right? And what you need to do actually, then you need to add two secant lines and crash them together. And because of that, you see, like you need to consider like the lowest two degrees. In characteristic two, you need to look at the lowest two degrees. So, you know, here you have like, you know, if you look at four, one, genus one and degree four, you also have to look at genus degree five. You look at genus two, degree six, you also have to consider seven, and so on and so forth. Okay, so in characteristic two, there's more work to do. So this is like uh, purely Eric, I think. If it were me, I would have stopped uh, long before considering characteristic two. But you know, Eric wanted to get the, the the full theorem, so he wanted to do all the cases. But and you know, and then what's the final thing that you need to do? The final thing, and this is the hardest part, right? I mean, this is the hardest part, and it's the part that I'm not going to explain at all, right? Is that you check the stability for these finitely many remaining cases. And then, you know, luckily actually, you know, some of this list coincides, you know, if some of this list coincides, if we go back to the history, you know, like seven, five and six, three and six, two and things, things like this. Some of this uh, list um, coincides with the, um, you know, with the classic, with the sort of results from the 80s. So, <clears throat> but in general, you know, the, the hardest part is actually doing the lowest degree things. And this really is mostly a case by case analysis. I mean, um, the, 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 like they fall, I mean, you know, the same trick works families of things, but uh, you know, yeah, you, you need to actually analyze and use really the geometry of the curve you know, the, the way this works is that, like, you know, the, the basic way that this works is that for each case, you know what surfaces this curve lies in, right? So you, you, you have a normal bundle sequence. So the game, so let me explain the game. So the game, what you want to do is you want to say that given the normal bundle of the curve, then you want to find a sub bundle Right. And how are you going to find line sub bundles? Well, I mean, the way you do it is that if you know that the curve is contained on some surface, right, then the normal bundle of the curve in the surface is going to give you some sub bundle. But of course, you see the difficulty with that is that this kind of thing, typically the degrees, you know, if you pick random size things, the degree of L and the degree of M are not so close. So if you want to, like if you wanted to prove that such a thing was semi-stable, right? It would be sufficient that, for instance, to make the degrees be the same, right? And that would be bad for stability because then that would show that it wasn't stable, right? So if you want to show that the stable, then like the better thing to do would be that if the degree of L is like the degree of M minus two or something like this. So then if they are really close, right? So that then like, you know, this gives you like, this makes it easier to prove stability, but you still need to prove that there isn't a line sub bundle of this degree, right? So then somehow you need to say that age not, age not of the normal bundle of C tensor by L inverse is equal to zero for all line bundles of the appropriate degree, appropriate degree being the slope of the normal bundle. Okay, so that's what you need to show. So like there are two things that you need to do. It's good to put it in this, in that thing, like this is what you need to do. But you see, now this is the kind of thing that you can specialize. So there are various tricks that you can do. One is that you can make the, the surface containing the can specialize the curve 
so that the surface containing it acquires some singularities along the along the curve to bump up the degree of L, right? So that's the kind of game that you can play. And you know, you for in each case, you need to say that there is such a surface, and then these degrees can be made close to each other. And then you need to say that, of course, there isn't such a thing. Again, now this kind of condition now is good for specializing, right? Like, you know, showing that some age naught is equal to zero. Like, you know, if you specialize the curve and the age naught there is zero, then for the general one, it has to be zero. So, you know, you have to find various specializations in each case to say that, you know, um, <clears throat> to say that, you know, in each of these cases in the normal bundle is stable. Anyway, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to each of these cases. I don't think that's the appropriate things to do in Zoom. I think I'm going to stop here because, you know, it's a good place to stop. That's the last lecture of the week. So maybe we stop a little early. All right. Thanks everyone for coming to the lectures. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, any question? Yeah. Can, so uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Go on. Sorry, is that? Can you scroll down to your theorem? Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, so just before the reduction steps. Yeah. Can you? Ah. Da, da, da. Uh, keep going, keep going. <laughs> ah, okay, um, so yeah, here, so for this uh, curve R, you know that the normal bundle is O of two plus O of four. And then when you strap on this extra curve, one of the factors bumps up by three and one of them bumps up by one. Can you see somehow visibly that uh, the correct, like the bumps, like the three bump occurs on this factor and the one bump occurs on the other factor? No, I mean, remember that this factor is not a well-defined thing. This factor is a well-defined thing, but this is not a well-defined thing. And what do you mean by that factor? Uh, what do you mean when you say it's not well-defined? Well, I mean, I mean, it, there isn't a unique O of two factor, right? Mm. Oh, I see. I see you choose one. I mean, uh, I mean, hmm. I mean, like the all four is canonically determined, right? But the all of two is not canonically determined. It's only determined modulo the all four. I see. I see. Yeah, I see. I see. Okay. Ah. Okay. So maybe that's not such a quick, clean answer. And then one more question um, before, when you said the um, later on, just down a little bit, you said that um, if you attach certain curves then these uh, adjustments become twists. Right, so like, you know, basically what I'm saying is that, so you suppose that you have a bundle of rank two, right? So here's your rank two thing. So like, first, if you make an elementary modification in one direction, and then you make an elementary modification in a separate direction, independent direction, right, then that becomes like twisting by minus that point, right? I see, I see. And so you know, basically what you're doing is that you just are saying that, you know, you can crash these two conics together at those four points, right? Such that like the tangent directions remain independent. I see. Okay. And then like also independent the tangent direction. Like, I mean, you know, first of all, like, you know, when you have this thing, right? Like the four tangent directions in the, of the curve already are pointing out of the plane, right? And then like, you know, you just need to say that with each of those four points, those directions span the normal bundle and things like that. And, you know, like you might wonder, um, you, you might wonder, where did that go? You, you might wonder why am I saying except in these cases, 
you see the problem here is that if you have a four conic four secant conic right like this degree four genus one curve is contained in the one parameter family of quadrics so there will be a quadric hypersurface that contains that right so then you see the problem is that like you know everything will be happening in the tangent bundle tangent spaces to those that quadrate so then you see you can't make them as independent as you want to make a similar thing if you have a twisted cubic then it's contained in many quadrics right and you know you can find one that con i mean in the case of twisted cubic of course you don't have a four secant conic that's your problem <laughs> like you know the, the, the you know any plane meets this thing in three points so you can't make the conic meet them in four points that, that that's what goes wrong in that case but, I mean, um but um anyway so you need to be a little bit careful in some of your beginning cases and you can see why that would make the induction the nightmare sort of because you know you need to make sure each time that you don't fall into one of these cases and stuff <clears throat> Yeah, that's what Eric is really great for. So, you know, you can give him any number of inequalities, you know, no matter what the number, he can still function with them, you know. I, I can do one or two inequalities, but by the time you're talking about 17 inequalities or something like this, then I can't function. But Eric, you know, it's, it doesn't face them, you know, he's like, give me more. <laughs> I had a, a question about the same part where you're attaching a conic. Yeah. Um, is the statement there that for like any conic, you can find like a general brill nothing curve intersecting it at four points would? No, the like... general conic. Okay, all right. The general conic. There is, no, there is no statement here for every curve. In fact, some of these theorems are going to necessarily be false for every curve, right? I mean, like if the curve has, like, you know, even in this example that we talked about due to Elico and Bellico and Elia, right? Um, um, so, so this example, right? I mean, if the curve starts becoming trigonal or hyperelliptic and things like this, then you will have all sorts of line bundles that will, you, you know, th this is, I believe, uh, I should have checked, but I think that this might actually be an if and only if. Like it's stable if and only if it's non-hyperelliptic and non-trigonal. I didn't double check that, but I have some memory of that. Um, yet you see, I mean, if you have like some extra thing, like, you know, say that you have a canonical curve and it happens to be trigonal or something like this, right? Then of course that will lie on the small surface scroll and then the normal bundle in the surface scroll can very easily destabilize it. So like, you can't hope to have something for every curve. It's, it's, it's always be going to be for the general one. Thank you. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, like, you know, this is an interesting question. I think I raised this question in one of the earlier things that, like, you know, suppose you have a variety X, right? And you have two rational curves, right? Meeting quasi transversely at one point. Suppose that this is. This has balanced normal bundle and this has balanced normal bundle. I mean, does the union have balanced normal bundle? Of course, if I ask it like that, the answer is no. And I gave you an example. Like you can have the union of two lines meeting at the point, and then you, you know, the, the sort of positive sum ends match, right? Um, but you know, like it should still be true that you know in the absence of some obvious geometric reason right then like and there is enough room to move all these curves right then it should be that like typically the positive sum ends should be as transverse to each other as possible i mean you know, there are cases of the theorem like the, sometimes that kind of statement is a theorem but um you know it's not so easy like as i said we understand sort of the restriction of the normal bundle of the curve to each individual component, but we don't understand the identification so well. I mean, it's not that we don't understand it so well, it's, it's hard to understand. That's like a question of multilinear algebra. So this is a difficult thing, I think. But you know, it would be nice to have some general criteria that would say that, 
under these circumstances, then you know the the positive segments of these normal ones are as transverse as possible. This would make a lot of the inductive arguments much simpler. But as far as I know, I think you have to think about it in each case and actually prove it theorem. You can't just, it's not the free thing. Is there any expectation uh, for the same kind of a question? Instead of P3, you look at a general hypersurface of degree D in P4. So do you expect like Fano or general type or what would be the expectation if at all there is one? Well, I mean, you know, there is a meta principle here, right? I mean, I mean, I, I was about to send you an email actually about this, but uh, anyway, I'll, I, I didn't quite finish it. So I didn't hit send, but so, 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 you know, the meta principle should be like this, right? Right, I mean, I mean, in the absence of an obvious geometric reason, the bundle should be as general as possible, right? I mean, right. <laughs> in the absence of an obvious geometric reason, I'm not sure that I should even write this down, but let's write it down. Maybe we should ask you to stop recording or something, but anyway. I have no shame, so I'll just say it. In the absence of an obvious geometric reason, the normal bundle should be as general as possible. And you know, basically each time you prove this thing in a specific case, it becomes a theorem. And then there are examples where it's not quite true, right? I mean, so, so like, you know, you can just say that, say that you have any variety and you have a family of curves on it. I mean, you can always say that I expect the normal bundle to be stable. Then there will be some cases like, you know, if it happens that like there are some special things about the tangent bundle or like, you know, some special things about the family of curves, like, you know, we talked about complete intersections, for instance, then the normal bundle is not going to be stable typically, right? Then, you know, and that's, then you would declare that that was an obvious geometric reason. So the way I stated it, it's sufficiently um, meaningless that I think that you probably can't find a counterexample to this meta principle. But um, you know there are theorems like this. So for instance, like you know if you have a Fano threefold, right? And if you have a covering family of rational curves, covering family of rational curves. I believe this is a theorem of Ming Shen, and hopefully I'm stating it correctly. Um, that then the theorem is that like you know the normal bundle is of the general member of the family is balanced with the exception of conics and P3. That's the only exception. Um, and you know something like that should be in general true, right? I mean if you have a final variety and you have a covering family of rational curves, you know, you need to make some assumption on the family, otherwise you'll run into trouble that, you know, you can have a small degree rational curve in piano or something like this and the analogs of that. But, you know, somehow you want to say that then you expect the normal bundle to be stable, except when it can't be. But you know, the reason why it can't be is like in PN because you see that it's degenerate so that it can't be stable. Like, and similarly, you can say the same thing that you know, if you have a general enough family of curves, you know, you can ask whether the normal bundle is always stable. There, I don't, yeah, you know, I don't know any results like this other than this P3 result. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and you know, as I said, that's also not, you don't have to restrict yourself to curves, right? Like, I mean, you can always ask, suppose that I have a random map from P2 to some variety, is the normal bundle stable? Again, you know, in the absence of obvious restrictions, then, you know, why not? I mean, the one caution is that, you know, the other kind of question that you can ask is that suppose you have a bundle on X, 
and you have a family of rational curves, you can ask what's the restriction of E to this rational curve. And again, you can ask whether that's as balanced as possible. Um, again, you know, there are theorems like this. If I take X to be P2, right? And then if you take a general stable bundle, E general stable bundle with given invariance, and you restrict E to a line, then this will be balanced. Right, but it's not true for every stable bundle. For instance, I could take the tangent bundle of P2 and take some square of that, right? Then if I restrict this thing to lines, then I will have three different sum nets, for instance. Let, like, I mean, obviously, you know, you have to state obvious geometric reason and general enough possible <laughs> carefully otherwise you can give examples where it's not true but there's a large class of examples where it is true and, and you know this is sort of governed by Grauert Mulek in this case there are some restrictions as to which ones can occur but even in the case of p2 there is an open problem here can you find a stable bundle on p2 such that the restriction to the general line is any possible splitting subject to the grauert muley restrictions? As far as I know, we don't know the answer to that. So, you know, you can make a lot of these examples where there is an expected thing, but, um, you know, and then you can always conjecture that, like, you know, <clears throat> the unexpected behavior occurs in the expected co-dimension by the expected co-dimension you mean, is like the co-dimension of your behavior and the versal deformation space of the bundle. But, um, you know, I gave you some examples in these lectures where that's really what happens and some examples where it's not quite like that. So, and, but I think that the meta principle, like, you know, if you're going to bet one way, then you should bet that it's going to be the general behavior, right? I mean, it's going to be more likely to be true than not. So I was wondering if the meta principle could be turned around in the sense that, say you have a bundle and then somehow you prove it's not stable or semi-stable, can you then say that there is, you can you then say that, you know, there's, there's a reason why it's special. I mean, I'm, I'm more interested in statements like that, I guess. There uh, are cases like this, right? I mean, like that's like how the grauert mulich theorem, for instance, works, right? If you can- Which theorem is this? grauert mulich I mean, this theorem, like, you know, let me say it's much more general than this, but let me tell you this simple case. Like, it says that suppose that you have a stable bundle on PN. Okay. So then it says that the restriction to a line, right, is something, it splits, right? I mean, it doesn't say that it's balanced, but it says that the differences are at most one. Like, you know, so say that you write it like this. Right? Then it says that AI minus AI minus one is less than or equal to one. So this is a general line. And it's more general than that. You know, if you have a stable bundle on any, pro on any projective variety and you look at the restrictions to a complete intersection, then if you look at the hardener or somehow filtration, then like, you know, the diff successive differences with the hardener or somehow factors cannot be too large. That's what the theorem says. <clears throat> and then you see the, the proof of that thing somehow works like this. Suppose that you had like a really unbalanced thing. And then you, you roughly say that, okay, then you can glue these things together to destabilize this bundle. So there are some arguments like this, but they tend to be delicate and like, you know, have conditions. Um, you know, like, I mean, the, what, the game that you try to play is that, of course, if this thing is really unstable, right, then you look at the harder somehow factor, then you want to argue that somehow those glue together, you know, to give a sub bundle of the tangent bundle, maybe, or something like this, that, um, I mean, you know, I didn't talk about this, but maybe I should have talked about this. So star and Tian. 
this is Zhu Tian, have theorems like this about stable rational connectedness, which is like you can leverage the stability of the cotangent bundle to prove separable rational connectedness. So like, you know, somehow like, <clears throat> you know, the way you can sort of think about this is that like, you know, I mean, you know, we talked about, for instance, when is the restriction of tangent bundle of the Grassmannian to rational curve not balanced? And there, there was the global reason that, you know, the tangent bundle of the Grassmannian was a tensor product of two vector bundles. So, you know, while the individual bound parts could be balanced, then when you tensor them, then they won't be balanced in general. So, so like, but, you know, proving something like this, it's typically a hard theorem, right? I mean, like, somehow from knowing that each of the lines are unbalanced to proving like proving a global de decomposition tensor decomposition tangent bundle i think would be pretty hard i mean you know there are instances of theorems like that but then they tend to be fairly famous theorems i mean i'm sure i'm forgetting other instances where this kind of thing happens but um but I mean, you're absolutely right that like, you know, <laughs> sort of the contrapositive of the meta principle is also interesting if they are not finding the geometric reason, but you know, that kind of theorem tends to be usually harder. Thanks a lot. Yeah.